Hello, everyone. Time for my post well, post convention vlog con report thing. In this case, uh, for Carbring Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2024. Um, this was over the weekend of September 28th and 29th at the Oregon Convention Center, as it has been held for basically as long as I've been going there. Um, breakdown of my schedule for what I was doing over the course of a couple days was day one was basically the well schedule for uh my, my my panel day um long story short i had lots of um like panels i really wanted to go to on on saturday um almost more or less to like the end of the day um and then a bunch of panel and then like a small handful of smattering of panels on uh Sunday, so Sunday ended up kind of being my shopping day. And of those, like the, the big ones, I would say, that I went that I really enjoyed. Um, so I missed my 10 o'clock panel I wanted to go to. I ended up coming in a little late. Um, which was the uh panel for um Apple II games. Because as somebody who grew up on Apple II, like while I personally owned an Atari 800 computer as a kid. My school computer lab had a Apple II, and so Apple IIs play a significant portion of my childhood. So I did want to go to that panel, but was not able to make it. Um, and um, so, fortunately, Portland Retro Gaming Expo, they have all they, all of their panels tend to go up on as videos on their YouTube channel at some point. So if any of these sound interesting, those will be on there. I will find the YouTube channel and put a link to it in the show notes for those who want to go. Um, first big one was um, the D&D history panel, which was done in the ballroom by Michael Whitmer, Whitmer um, Kyle Newman, and John Peterson. Uh, Peterson is the author of Playing at the World and its various sequels, The Elusive Shift, which covers so Playing at the World covers the origins of Dungeons and Dragons, how it came to be how it was originally rules were created, including the rules for um like how it how it emerged from the concept of the Ronstein game. Um and then to the actual creation of the rules themselves. Playing out the war uh Elusive Shift then covers how the rules changed and evolved what basically once players got contact with it out in the world. And then uh, the game wizards handled um discussed the legal difficulties with happening internally within uh, TSR and also involving TSR and outside the rest of the industry, ultimately leading to the ouster of and depart or departure and ouster of Dave Arneson and the ouster of Gary Gygax. And also for that matter, the Blooms, basically the, the entire original management triumvirate basically getting ousted. Michael Whitmer also um, wrote a biography of Gary Gygax, um, Empire of um, Imagination. We'll check out the copy over here. Yes, Empire of Imagination, uh, which I previously reviewed on the blog. Link to that is also going to be in the show notes. And all of them, um, three of them, collaborated on the Art and Arcana book and also the lore and legends book on the development of Zenith and Dragons 5th edition, along with some of the art design of fifth, that went into the 5th edition, various rule books and adventures. So, that was like, okay, that's a high priority thing. Unfortunately, like, I had intended to bring books to be signed. Unfortunately, I um, slipped up and did not bring the books on Saturday, and they weren't there on, and um, Whitmer and Peterson were not here I think I mentioned on Sunday. So I ended up lugging around books that um, couldn't get signed. I will get back to you on and, and stick a pin in that. We're going to get back to this in a bit because there's another thing I'm going to talk about as well. Um, at noon was a panel with uh, Bethan Walker and Colin Ryan, the second voices for Alice and Alpha Node from Final Fantasy XIV. Um, I forget who Alice A's original voice was, but Alpha Node. First voice was um, Sam Regal, and um, I ended up 
I, I thought about going to that panel. Like, I was a split between that panel. There's a 30th anniversary panel about the making of Alien vs. Predator on the Jaguar. Like, really split of the two of those. I ultimately ended up going to neither. But I was hungry, and I needed to get lunch. Uh, 11 o'clock was the panel by Jeff Minter on the history of Lamasoft. Um, it was somewhat streamlined. It did feel a bit like an extended... Um, Hey, there's a documentary about my life story that's worth checking out. And also, um, uh, digital extremes, um, not digital extremes, um, um, digital clips, sorry. Um, you come to come up with something, you come up with the vary their names a little better. Um, digital eclipse did, uh, their second big, um, collection thing, um, uh, after Prince of Persia. Sat um his museum um game on Jeff Minter. So between those two, like it did feel like Minter's like, hey, there's these other sources you can go to to get more information. Um, and so his his presentation about his own stuff was generally very like, thousand mile, not thousand mile, like hundred mile overview of things, which was fine. Um, it was fun, like having this from his perspective and getting to hear this from him. Um, things I particularly appreciated. Minter was, Minter is very candid about the heavy presence of software piracy in the UK games scene, particularly around this, uh, ZX Spectrum, um, various ZX consoles, also the, the pet and Vic 20 and that sort of thing. All these various consoles that ran off that ran their software off audio cassettes and Minter's general vibe about it was like, yeah, we all did that. I did that too. I still made and sold games. We're like, and it, it make, it's interesting getting that perspective. And honestly, I suspect, um, from a sort of, big picture preservation side of things. I got a sneaking hunch that there's that unless like I'll, everybody taped over their, um, their ZX spectrum games, whenever they got the Amiga, um, I got a sneaking hunch that probably actually game preservation in the UK might actually be in a better, like of like older PC games of like, a, of like this particular era is probably a bit better in a bunch of respects than say, PC game preservation in the Apple II uh, Atari 800 because, like, oh, everybody's tape recording and copying games to tapes. And you have able to use existing infrastructure for tape duplication for, you know, uh, recording albums, particularly what you get to, like, the UK punk scene, for example. That, oh, lots of people, it, like, makes... So it makes it easier for larger print runs of software to get out at a more affordable price. We'll see. I, I, I'm actually interested in digging into that further. Um, I'm going to get back to that in just a second. Here's another thing. Um, partway through, like, the end of this panel, like, I ended up, like, dropping on, like, a little bit early. Just enough that I was, like, outside because I, I needed to plug in my, my phone. And there wasn't any place in the room where I could plug in my phone. My, my phone's charger. So I had to, like... I got in the Q&A, I stepped out, plugged in my phone, and then the building's fire alarms went off. Um, fortunately, not related to my charger. For a moment, um, the building didn't, the staff of the Morgan Convention Center did an investigation and mentioned that there was some food cooking in one of the um, food preparation areas that was burned and set off the smoke detectors. But that was, that was a, a rather uh, surprising moment. Um, that didn't mean like this was the day where my phone's charge was a bit more on the raggedy side of things because I didn't spend like half an hour outside um, where I could plug my phone in again. Um, panel after this was uh, Jeremy Parrish's Dragon Warrior Reconsidered panel. Um, discussing the history of Dragon Warrior a little bit in the U in Japan before getting into the U.S. release and how things went there, and discussing the 
perception of Dragon Warrior, whether it was a success or not. Um, the, the synopsis of this would say is, like, it did well enough that Enix decided to release 2, 3, and 4 on the NES themselves. So that in and of itself does kind of say, hey, it was fairly successful. The perception of a failure comes from Nintendo basically overprinting the game, not necessarily considering the fact that this, that by the time it came out in the U.S. in 1989, uh, Dragon Warrior, which was came out in 1986 in Japan, was like three years old and reflected that, which is probably also one of the reasons why Fantasy took off a bit more. Um, after that... I remember going to the um, Frank Cifaldi's panel after that. And then the Retronauts podcast panel. I think I dropped out and did something else from the um, in the three o'clock slot. Uh, I think I've been done. I think there might have been another walk around the um, convention center space just to kind of peruse some stuff and uh, play some games. Um, Talk about what games I played on Saturday in just a minute. Um, went to Frank Cifaldi's Video Game History Foundation panel. Oh, I remember one too. I checked out some of the museum spaces. In particular, we had um, the Video Game History Foundation Museum at the convention this year was on 1997, which is basically the point. The way that the museum exhibit portrayed it is um, 97 is the being the year the games grew up. I kind of see that 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 I almost describe it more as the de- as the year that video games entered adolescence. You still have like, a massive number of games being made at a market targeted for kids, like in terms of licensed from children's cartoons, like Tiny Toon Adventures, for example. Um, but this is also the point where Doom Two comes out, we have Mortal Kombat coming out, we have. Um, Lots more of these more violent, graphically violent games coming out at this time. And this makes for a point where um, it, at this point with like Mortal Kombat is the point where this draws the attention of game leg- of, of uh, legislators in the United States. And we, this is where we get, start getting stuff like the congressional hearings about game violence, where you get the, the uh, visual of, Joe Lieberman holding the purple, well, no purple, uh, blue, the um, uh, light blue, neon blue um, light gun that came with Lethal Enforcers. The, um, get the name of the Lethal Enforcer pistol. That was the Justifier, the Konami Justifier. So, talking about that. Um, then for that, um, the Vegan History Foundation prototype panel, that was that was fun, talking about, okay, what are game prototypes in the context of what we as, as collectors, archivists, and enthusiasts tend to see, like what pops up on eBay and that sort of thing. And oftentimes, basically saying, hey, these are quite frequently, but not always, games that are most of the way done. If there are any differences like within like the, the cartridge era, these are games that are generally most of the way done. If there are significant differences, they are like graphical things, like or minor glitches. Occasionally, there are exceptions, like for example, with um, Sonic Two, where there's just a whole uh, world that's not there in the final version of the game, for example. But a lot of times, for game cartridges, it's a mostly finished game because cartridges are incredibly expensive to, to make, and if they're using EEPROMs, which are rewritable, you know, oftentimes the studio wants those back because they're expensive and then they can reuse them. Once you get the PlayStation era, you start seeing more likely getting games that are very easy to find, um, games that are much more of a work in progress because burned discs are cheap. Probably speaking at this point, but um, not probably speaking, considerably speak, uh, cheaper than um, than uh, a cartridge prototype, but not cheap, but still not quite cheap as chips, so to speak, use the UK expression. Um, and um, then once we get more close to the modern era, digital distribution for prototypes becomes more common over, particularly over like the late 360 and into the Xbox um, One era, 
um, PS3, PS4 era, that sort of thing. And so I bring up the, uh, I brought up the, the preservation of games on cassettes and floppy disks earlier. I did ask uh, Frank Cifaldi during the Q&A section, hey, has, hot, what's the state of prototype preservation and um, looking out to find stuff during the, or PC games in general, but particularly during the floppy to um, CD-ROM era. And his answer is like, not really. Like nobody, nobody is looking for necessarily prototypes of Baldur's Gate 2 or prototypes of, um, of SSI, any of SSI's gold box games or of, uh, um, Microsoft Flight, older versions of Microsoft Flight Simulator, that sort of thing. So that is, in a lot of respects, a uncharted territory. So I'm interested to see that. I'm I'm not in a position to go around like trying to see if I can seek out these prototypes myself. But it's good to know that that there is this un, that there is that there are worlds yet to conquer and preserve in terms of video games. Um. And in terms of the collectors versus archivist angle, Sibaldi does take a fairly nuanced tack on this in the sense of like what the what's in the prototypes that the collectors are buying, slabbing and archiving, slabbing and keeping in shelves for as a theoretical investment, probably is isn't that much necessary of anything that's hasn't already been dumped. That said, it's also not actually a good investment. Um, like the general discussion I've gotten when it came, like the vibe I got when it came to talking to people, talking about game collecting and game preservation, except from the people who like directly work, like are direct employees of WADA and Heritage Auctions, who very much want you to buy games as, um, for the purposes of, of, as, of being a financial investment. And also in the case of Heritage Auctions now, manga and tabletop role-playing games as a financial investment um the general sentiment from all of them is like from the from the from the, from the i would say the more serious veteran collectors who've been in the field for a while is collectibles as investments are a bad idea don't do it if you want to invest at to, to if you're looking to invest for the future don't do it in collectibles put it in the 401k Put it in an IRA. Put it in something else. Don't like. Don't buy a slabbed copy, or, or don't slab your copy, um, your inbox copy of um, Ken Griffey Jr. Baseball, because you're planning to have your kids sell it as uh, planning to sell it for your kids' college, or to sell it to uh, as part of your retirement, or that sort of thing. It's not actually going to be worth that much at the time. Not only that, it's pro not just because it's a common game, but also in the context of um, the like, the amount of value it's going to gain from being slabbed or retain over time is not necessarily going to defray the value of the appraisal overall. So it's not a reliable, steady, safe investment. Not worth planning your planning to, to have your future be in slabbed records, comics, books, um, video games, whatever. And then kind of wrapping things up for the day, I went to um, the Wirtonauts panel on the history of Bowser in popular media, which, which was fun. Uh, th this, they did a similar panel last year with Mario. It was like, both of them are light, generally fluffy things. Um, panels and like, a good like wind down chill out amusing thing and this this will certainly be on the retro knots podcast feed um and also they'll probably do the video if they don't do the video version on their on the prge youtube channel it'll be in the podcast feed worth watching or listening to so um games i played on saturday saturday was mainly pinball Saturday was um, particularly Bally had a whole bunch of new pinball tables out for, um, at the convention for like licenses. Like pinball is now a mostly licensed game thing, and I did the ones for John Wick, 
the Showa Godzilla movies and Rush because I'm, I'm a fan of Rush. Um, of the tables, I I did the best on the Godzilla table, and in general, in terms of the design, I like the Godzilla and John Wick ones the best. Um, they had more interesting stuff that felt in theme with the work, um, like particularly for ball locks. Um, John Wick ha like has one for um, his uh, cellar where he's got all his gun in the first movie where he's got all those guns and cash and stuff where like it pops up the thing and you the ball locks down there. The Godzilla one has a has a building which is a, a target that you knock balls in there, it locks the balls, and when you get three balls in there, it triggers a multi-ball. It's a lot of fun. I managed to get that get that multi-ball. The whole thing was great. I also appreciate the Godzilla table gives the option for Japanese or English audio, which is also nice. Um, Sunday. Sunday was shopping day. I did go to a few panels, but Sunday was, like in a lot of big ways, shopping day. Um, didn't buy a lot of games. Um, the, 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 I was looking for basically my goal was okay because I have the Polymega I wanted to see okay how much are Saturn games going on um, or possibly PC Engine CD if I could find some like PC Engine in general uh, how much is uh, uh, then how much is um um, like get the Sega CD, like particular games I was looking for, uh, maybe Silphied. I ended up finding one that was like 30 bucks, 30, 40 bucks. And I was thinking about coming back around for it later, but ended up not doing so. And then for other games, uh, for N64, I was looking for, um, Pinky Free Junior Baseball for N64 because I really enjoyed playing that on Nintendo Power Retrospectives. And I was looking for, um, I was looking for Robotron 64. That was another game I really liked. And I thought oh, this is probably relatively common. Well, Ken Griffey Jr. I found. I only found one of them. But I found it wasn't too hard. All things considered. Could not find a Robotron 64 for the life of me. I don't know if this was a... People bought these up because um, Eugene Jarvis worked on it and they wanted to get to sign it because Eugene Jarvis at the convention or what. But um, I just couldn't find the damn thing. Any copies of it. And so I instead, um, the other game I picked up, uh, games I picked up were um, Super Fabricom version of Front Mission. This is a... I emulate, play this emulated without owning a physical copy in the past. I'm like, I want to have a physical copy of it now. I do have um, the Switch remastered version, but, and, and a physical copy, but I still need to get the um, uh, Front Mission 2. That one's probably going to be getting digitally because I can't, I missed the boat on getting a physical copy of it. It's sold out. Um, and I picked up the godfather for the ps2 um i have the pc version it sounds like the pc version does not run as well on modern computers and that leaves either the xbox version which i don't believe is backwards compatible or the ps2 version and i've got a ps2 so that settled things a fair bit also like i have the strategy guide for it which applies across all versions so yeah um and this was my day for getting into the free play arcade. Um, had my best Miss Pac-Man run to date. I will put my score up um, on the screen. Not a high score or anything like that, at least not on, on the machine for the day. But I, I normally I get past the first uh, act break cutscene and then wipe out. This time I got to the first act break cutscene with um, Deathless and then died a couple times, made it to the second act break, and then um, uh, then, then got wiped out there. But that's better than I've usually done, so that's pretty good. Um, and other than that, I played Golden Tee Golf. Golden Tee Golf was one of those games where I have 
been aware of it. I've been in the presence of it in pizza parlors and other pl- and bars and other places, but never actually bothered to play the game. And at long last, I played it and I sucked at it. Um, and I think it was to a degree of me figuring out, trying to figure out the trackball controller. Um, because like the way. Golden T works. If you have not seen it in the wild, with trackball, you roll back to wind up your swing, forward to launch it, and you can do it angles going back or forward, which will determine how the swing will go or how you intend the swing to go before wind and other factors in the terrain get involved in it. Um, and as with actual golf, it is tricky to actually directly launch the ball in the way that you intend. You will unintentionally slice or hook a lot. And when it came to me actually playing the game, um, at least on this machine, I did very badly, worse than I normally do on video golf games. Um, like on the front nine, I was 29 over par. And as far as like, some of this is me having never actually had the, this, my, this being my first time to actually try and play golf. golf. On the other hand, like, Golden Tee Golf. I, I don't know if this game, um, like everything's set to free play. I don't know how it's set up for when you need to put in additional quarters. Like if you get, for example, if you get, um, in terms of like when it asks for mo- more money, because if it's if, it, if normally it asks for more money, say. We, like, after a certain number of holes that are over par, I would be like, I would end up feeding a bunch of quarters into the actual game at this point. Um, instead of it being on free play. And I bring this up because of how the game communicates or doesn't communicate information. I wish I brought my tripod for my phone with me so I could try and do some recording of me playing it so you can kind of get an idea what the screen looks like. Well, really, the machine I was on also had like a bit of like a vertical hold issue on the screen. But anyway, um, because what comes to because the golf games I'm most familiar with are the ones that ultimately have the three click gauge. Tap once to start your swing. Tap once to um, tap or click once to set your power. Tap one tap again to set your accuracy. And or. As far as like whether you're going and uh, by extension whether you're going straight or hooking or slicing, either intentionally or on purpose, or intentionally either unintentionally or or on purpose, I should say. And how it pans out in the game is you're going strictly on vertical cues based on your backswing, how much your power is, and it doesn't give you a lot in terms of your follow in terms of when you're doing the forward push and the follow through on the swing itself. And that's messy. It makes for it for me to tricky to tell. Like I've had swings like, okay, I have I'm going for a full power swing here. I should be getting up on the green based on the information the game's provided on um what's the maximum range of the club is, what the wind direction is doing, and that sort of thing. And no, instead I'm really short and end up in say in the water hazard and getting a, a one stroke penalty, for example. It's a failure to communicate information reliable again probably with, with additional practice i could, could probably do better but i could also def, definitely get like this is a definitely understand now why nobody bothered porting golden tea to home consoles and it's not just because of the of the trackball as far as panels of the day went um i went to a panel by i want to call him the cool scott that is the Scott Adams of um, Adventure International. 
company who put out, uh, who basically made their, uh, put out the home versions of Colossal Cave Adventure, which not exactly Colossal Cave Adventure, but like their own variations of it, um, with Adams having done a lot of the original work. This panel ended up doing, not going through the whole thing of it because it, the panel behind it was canceled and Adams had a lot of material to cover and it went long. Um, on someone on purpose end up dropping out probably about the halfway point when the video game crash happened and how that carried over to PCs. Um, Adams, I will say this as a heads up, if you're going to go see the panels, I need, he's okay with people who are not okay with this and politely bow out. And move on. Uh, Adams is a fairly religious, not in the asshole way person. Adams, Adams talks a fair bit about the role of religion and his eventually and God and his eventual conversion and his conversion to Christianity at partway through his uh, career um, and the roles of that in his life considerably so. And he brings this up a lot. It's he. he so this is this is a story that is as much about his career and his work and his process as a game designer as much as it is um about his religious um experiences and becoming a, a christian and i could say, and like from the circumstances where this happened um in, in his life i will say Admitting that I bowed out early, he feel he is not the kind of person. He doesn't feel like he is the kind of person who's go, "Oh, I was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and then I, then I found God, and now I'm super pure and that sort of thing." Um, and I view people who use recreational drugs or were, um, in or who have extramarital sex or. That's where they, I, I never got the question, like, I never got the vibe that, like, this, that this Scott Adams is even remotely the level of asshole that the tunist Scott Adams is. Um, that said, there is a certain degree of, uh, of tiresomeness when it comes to, that can come out of a person who had some hard times found religion and it helped them, but then feels very determined that they need to share this story repeatedly, that can get tiresome. It could be countered a bunch of times. So a heads up there. Like, ultimately, like my, my reason for my departure was less me having lost interest or if I, I get tiresome and more, I had to go get lunch and use the bathroom. So there's that. Um... There was a 52 years of Atari panel, which I'm going to watch the VOD of. Um, I ended up getting back from my lunch before the, um, or after the panel started, which had Nolan Bushnell and among others, and was moderated by um, Chris Kohler. So that that should be an interesting panel to, to watch on the VOD once that goes up. Um, Chris, Chris Kohler is the right guy to be a moderator for this sort of thing, having listened to multiple episodes of Retronauts that he hosted back when, back in the day. Um, so did some more shopping, then went to the Playdate panel this for the, the Playdate handheld system. Um, that was a really interesting story to get in terms of the, the design of the Playdate system, the process for making it, and that sort of thing. Um, and like some of the design decisions that were made in terms of why they, like, for example, hey, we're, we want to get people to make games for the system. What are our easiest ways to get people to make this? Let's open up the platform software-wise and let people sideload games that they buy off, say, itch.io, or that sort of thing. Not really having any DRM, necessarily, which was nice. Um, last panel of the day I went to was a collecting panel with Metal Jesus Rocks and uh, Radical Reggie, which was a lot of fun. Um, 
And just in terms of like, it's good when it comes to like talking about collecting. I mean, I'm a bit of a collector, but I'm not like a collector collector. And it is fun hearing these conversations with um, Metal Jesus and with Reggie, kind of like having these opportunities for them to take the temperature. Okay, this is where collecting is at from people who are very into game collecting, but also are not like, not like John Hancock, the immortal John Hancock, where they are super hardcore, I'm going for complete systems. Or like uh, Pat the NES Punk, where I go, he, he's like, not like people who are going for, I'm going to go for full systems, but more, I collect the things that catch my interest, which um, look fun or neat, and that sort of thing. And it's good having that approach to kind of set the temperature of where collecting is at, but also, like, they are the right people to kind of reground you in terms of collecting. Like, oh, hey, like, yeah. Um, and it felt like sometimes it's it's just worth it to just, you know, collect the cheap sports games that you find for um, filling up bins at game stores. Like, hey, NBA uh, NFL 2K is actually a really good series of football games. And yeah, the stats are out of date, but it's a good, solid football game. Um, and like, probably at some point, like with the emulation communities and consoles getting modded and that sort of thing, or consoles getting modded and cracked open and that sort of things, there's probably going to be like people going, "Hey, listen, you want for uh, NFL 2K, um, uh, 2K15 uh, or 2K5? You want the current stat NFL stats? Got those for you. Um, run as a mod pat uh, as a patch. Uh, just patch the game ISO and put it on your ODE, that sort of thing. And then after that, I, I did a little bit more shopping um, after that panel. And like, no, I didn't. I got the panel. I basically after that panel, I basically just kind of cleared out uh, for the day. Which leads to my other thing I need to talk about because this was the day where I was carrying around a book that I wanted to get signed for people who weren't there, and then picking up the other books that they wrote, and so carrying two very heavy books around my bag plus my games. So I'm going on camera for a minute. So I'm bringing my background on camera. Like, room environment my on camera for a minute so I can properly show off without the NVIDIA background remover unfairly fil unreasonably filtering out this. This is the new bag of holding. Uh, I backed this on Kickstarter and this is what I use to help get me through the convention. Um, like back in the day, um, I had an original bag of holding that was bought from Thinky, which was really great and sold really well. Or it sold really well. It had a lot of pockets, and I basically used it to death. It needs to be in bad shape. As some as holes in it need to be mended. Um, this one, like, so I backed this one on Kickstarter. I wanted one that's in better shape, um, with a more robust build quality. Since I can't replace the old ones, it's not available anymore. Um, this one has more pockets, heavier build. Um, has a nice pattern on the strap, D20 pattern, um, lots of great, like additional pouches in it. For example, um, in this pocket here, like this one on, uh, this side, big enough to hold your glasses case. No problem. This one big enough where I was able to put my analog pocket in there. Um, and like with enough space to spare that I probably could have put a OG um, gray, uh, gray brick Game Boy in there as well. And to put my um, put books in there, a uh, grocery bag with games in it, and then fold it up and put like, in terms of the grocery bag itself. And then when it was going on the bus or elsewhere, or train or elsewhere, I could fold up the bag and put it in one of those pockets and have it be out of sight. So I never don't everybody getting lost or people trying to grab it or that sort of thing. Um, it held up with the those heavy books in there without any excessive wear and tear on the bag itself in terms of any worries about structural failure. It was still heavy on my shoulder when I had slung over it. I have not tried the backpack straps on the back. Honestly, 
with the two books in there. I probably should have tried that, but that was that's a me problem. Um, that's not a bag problem. So the bag of holding, really great. Really enjoyed it. Uh, really found it useful. Um, that is definitely going to be part of my like, returning to being part of my regular on thing now. Um, I like it more than having a backpack. Oh, one other issue. Um, so the original bag of holding, I was able to kind of like clip my water bottle to it. Um, I don't really feel the same level because with the handle, because the handle was um, not as big around as the handle on this one. Like this one, it's a good handle for like carrying, but it's not a good handle for clipping things to for like a water bottle on it with a carabiner or that sort of thing. So I don't know. So it make there's a pocket on one of the sides that you can fit a water bottle in, but it does run into issues where as the water bottle gets emptier and thus lighter, it's more likely to inadvertently push the water bottle. Um, otherwise though, it's all right. I found it, it absolutely did what it needed to do and got me through the convention. Um, probably going to use the, I think maybe for Portland Retro Gaming Expo in the future, I might still stick with a backpack just because of weight distribution, but for like the Loracon and that sort of thing where I'm traveling a little bit lighter might stick with it. also I'm, maybe next time i'll actually try using the backpack straps this time and see how that works out anyway um that's my thoughts on portland retro gaming expo did you go if you did please post in the comments below and let me know what your pickups were i'm interested to hear what you have to say catch you later Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.